series of messages that we started several weeks ago entitled Overcoming Our Fears or Really No Fear Living. And we've been talking about different fears that, that God wants us to overcome, such as fear of the future and the fear of dying and the fear of failure and um, really overcoming our financial fears as we talked last week. Whenever you stop and look at all the various fears or phobias we have, then you understand that God wants us to, you know, demonstrate great faith in those areas of our lives. Satan comes with great fears. And so it's important for us to understand that God wants faith then to come in control of our lives. And when that happens, fear loses control of our lives. And so let me just encourage us today to really let God speak to us about this particular issue that we're going to address as we wrap up this series of messages. Now, I'd be the very first to tell you that five sermons on fear doesn't exhaust the various things the Bible says about it. So you can just be assured that in a couple of years, we'll come back and pick up and do some more fear sermons. How about that? Um, But what I was going to say is the fear we're going to talk about today Day is this fear of commitment. You guys know what I'm talking about? I mean, we live in a culture that is absolutely terrified of this word commitment because the word commitment carries with it, you know, it kind of reeks of things like accountability and integrity and discipline. Um, and so, you know, it shows up in a whole bunch of different ways. We want to bell out rather than kind of blast through. We'd rather leave than last. We would rather throw in the towel than stay in the game. We waver and we waffle rather than hold steady and move forward. Now, I would also just share with you, commitment means that you pledge yourself to a position no matter what the price tag, that you pledge yourself to a cause, no matter what the cost, that you pledge yourself to a marriage, no matter what the difficulties are. You know, I would point out that commitment has some awesome, awesome, awesome returns. Now, many people never experience the unbelievable returns of deep commitment because they don't demonstrate or put it into practice in their lives. So that's why we want to take some time today and look at really, first of all, some of the reasons that we struggle with commitment in our lives. And, you know, that's one of the big challenges that so many of us have. We look at it and say, Rick, I don't even have any idea why I have such a deep struggle with commitment. Well, I want to take a few moments and just highlight a couple of things that probably contribute to that. First Kings 861 says, but your hearts must be fully committed to the Lord our God to live by his decrees and to obey his commands at this time. Now, the key word in that whole, that whole sentence is this, your hearts must be fully what? committed, fully committed. Circle that in your Bible. And if you use one of the Bibles from back of the chair, please circle those Bibles as well. See, many of us are not fully committed to the Lord. And because of that, we have a difficult time being fully committed to much of anything in life. So we fear commitment because we've been rejected. Um, We've been rejected sometimes by a spouse. We've been rejected sometimes by maybe a family member, a parent. Uh, We feel rejected by friends. We feel rejected by people we thought we could count on and trust. And you go through a few rejections, and after a while, you get afraid of what? commitment. That's what happens. That's where it leaves most all of us. And so you go through some rejections, you go through some disappointments, and then with it comes into our lives this fear of commitment. And then we fear commitment for some of us because we have broken so many commitments ourselves. You know, when we stop and look at it, We recognize that we have been the one who's broken commitments, that have walked away instead of charged through, that we've abandoned rather than rolled up our sleeves and figured our way through the situation. Psalm 37, 5 says, commit your way. Circle that word commit again. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he will do it. Now, Nike came out with this motto a few years ago called Just Do It. 
Well, let me put it this way. Just do it doesn't work. Because in this particular statement, God makes this statement. He says, commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and what? He will do it. He will do it. And that's the way you and I can experience commitment in our lives. So some of the reasons we struggle with commitment is because of rejection, and we struggle with it because of our own um, failure to demonstrate commitment um, in our own lives. And then... I want to take a minute and talk to us about how to increase our levels of commitment. Then we're going to look at Daniel chapter 6 and see an example of deep commitment. But how do we increase our level of commitment? Well, first of all, I would challenge you to start by deepening your commitment to your marriage and to your family. Let me, let me just describe marriage as this. You know, you read the novels, you watch the chick flicks. And how does it always end? Ultimately, they get hitched up and they go and they live what? Happily ever after. That sounds like cruise control marriage, doesn't it? Huh? Is that right? You know how you get on the interstate, there's not much traffic, and you just set it on, for me, 77. <laughs> so you set it on 77. Notice the cops don't bother me at 77. So you set it at 77. And you steer. And the road's smooth. And everything is hunky-dory. But marriage is not a cruise control relationship. Marriage is a four-wheeler relationship. <laughs> That's what it is. It's four-wheeler relationship. Now... Is a four-wheeler designed to put on an interstate, push the cruise control button, and just ride into the sunset happily ever after? No, it isn't. You may think it is, but it's not. All right. A four-wheeler is made what? To go through muck. It's made to go through sand. It is made to go through brush. It is made to go where you can't even hardly walk. You know... I like to hunt, and I've got some friends in Montgomery that were part of the church we used to pastor there, and I've gone hunting with them many, many times. And they have this hunting property that we just call it the Woodley Road Place, and because uh, it's right off of Woodley Road, so um, really profound way to describe that hunting camp. And um, so, and in that part of Alabama, they have what they call prairie soil or prairie mud. Now, if you've never experienced prairie soil or prairie mud, let me describe it to you. First of all, it is about as mucky as mud could ever get. But this mud has some other components. It has, I think, super glue in it. You get it on your boots, and you cannot get it completely off. You cannot. And if you walk through it, it's not like you just shake your foot and you get rid of the mud. No, it just keeps accumulating until you get a stick and push it off, okay? All right. Now, I have a two-wheel drive four-wheeler, all right? Not a four-wheel drive. My buddies have four-wheel drive ones. And I remember one time I was hunting with them, and, I mean, it's been raining like crazy. And so we're going through one of the yuckiest, muckiest prairie soil places you can go through. And, you know, I still remember them going into four-wheel drive and me going into, you know, first gear. And we end up crawling through that. Now, I will tell you something. You couldn't even walk through that. Because you remember what I told you about prayer soil? It so mucks up your boots that you probably couldn't walk 10 steps without having to scrape the junk off. And I'm not exaggerating. You know, and so, you know. That's the way marriage is, okay? There are a few times, Karen and I have been married 42 years, there are a few times I felt like we were in the prairie soil muck. You ever been there? If you've been married very long, you know what I'm talking about, all right? And when you get in the prairie soil muck, I promise you, you do not want to get in your sports car in prairie soil, all right? You've got to be in your what? four-wheeler you got to go into low gear and you have to what you just have to 
slosh your way through the mucky parts. Say, Rick, that doesn't sound like a lot of fun. Well, whoever said marriage was supposed to be fun? (laughs) Paul said, if you get married, you're going to have what? You remember what he said? Remember what he said? You're going to have trouble. Duh. (laughs) Trouble doesn't sound like fun to me, okay? Now, there are plenty of fun places, but if you think that's what it is, then here's what it is. You see marriage as a cruise control thing, and you get into the muck, and what are you going to do? You're going to start looking for exit ramps and ways out. One of the things I told Karen was that I would never, ever use the D word. You know what the D word is? The divorce word, all right? Never use the D word. And I have not in 42 years. I will also tell you, you don't use the threat of the D word. You don't use and do things that communicate you're leaving if you're going to not do the D word. How about that, okay? You simply, when you get into the mucky places, you understand that marriage is a what kind of relationship? A what kind? A four-wheeler kind of relationship, all right? Where you go into low gear, and you just keep moving forward. That is understanding commitment. It is understanding that marriage is not for the faint of heart. Marriage is not easy. We just have to do what? If we're going to demonstrate commitment, we have to do what? Keep on keeping on. Now, I know some of you, some of us in the room have gone through divorces, and I'm not trying to heap in one moment's guilt on you, okay? I'm not trying to do that. Because I realize there are, way, there are times that marriages do end, okay, tragically. But all I'm trying to communicate is this, that we've got to look at it and understand that God calls us to demonstrate great commitment in our marriages. And then deepen your commitment to your church and to God. You know, I think that most of us want to introduce our kids to an intimate vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ. We want to teach them how to pray and to read their Bible. If you want that to happen, then make sure they're in church. I'm always intrigued that all it takes for a lot of people is a little bit of either raindrops or sunshine, seems to me. You know, I never know on a weekend whether to pray for rain or pray for sun. I just don't. You know why? Because I know there's a certain group of people that if it's raining, oh my, they don't even know what an umbrella is. In fact, South Floridians sometimes, I think, just ought to live in North Michigan for a while. Seriously. I mean, we had 180 inches of snow the last winter, Karen and I were in North Michigan. You know how many times something was delayed in North Michigan with 180 inches of snow that winter? You know how many times anything was delayed? School was delayed. Any other thing? How many times? Zero. Zero. Well, see, I don't know whether to pray for rain, whether that'll just say, well, we can't go out on the boat today, or whether to pray for sunshine. Because either one has a way of affecting our commitment to church. I just want to help you to understand, your kids are learning a lot more by what you do than by what you say. And that's extremely important. I'm also always amazed by parents who don't understand that they are what? Parents. You know? Because I'll have people say, well, Rick, you know what my kids say to you? I say, oh, yes, I do. This is what they're going to say to you. I don't want to go. None of my friends will be there, which is probably a good thing. If you look at their list of friends, probably a real good thing, all right? Or it's not really my style. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Who carries these around in your pocket? You do, is that right? Now, my mom and dad weren't perfect, but they were pretty amazing. They have had five kids. And to this point, they've batted a thousand, which is pretty amazing. Because all five of us are deeply committed Christ followers. All five of us are still married to our first spouse. None of us have ever gone down the 
drugging, boozing, the four brothers chasing women routine. So they batted about a thousand. Now I haven't been quite as successful as my mom and dad was. But I'll have to tell you, if I'd have ever suggested that to my dad, not only would he have said, get yourself in the back seat of the car, we would have had a memorable session if there was any discussion about it. <laughs> and if you don't know what those memorable sessions were, again, as I've told you before, that was applying the board of wisdom and knowledge to the seat of understanding. It is amazing. Now, let me ask you something. Do you think that their deep commitment, and see, when I was growing up, we didn't just go to church one time a week. We went to Sunday school. We went to church on Sunday morning. We went to church on Sunday night. We went to church on Wednesday night. We had revival meetings two or three times a year, and those would go 10 days every night. We would go to camp meetings, and there would be three services a day. And you know how many times we ever had a conversation in my house about whether I was going or not? <laughs> Zero times, because it was not a conversation piece. You understand what I'm saying, okay? It wasn't. So, Rick, they must have been brutal parents. Oh, my. They were absolutely the best on the planet, okay, is what they were. And I just want to challenge us to understand, if we want to build deep commitment in our kids, quit whipping out on this parenting thing. Quit whipping out on it, all right? And just understand, we set the pace. And then deepen your commitments to God's principles as a Christian single if you're not married. Um, 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, Do not be down, bound together with unbelievers for what partnership does righteousness and lawlessness have? And what fellowship has light with darkness? Now, let me put that in the simplest, most specific terms I can put it in for those of us or those in the room that are single. What that means is this. Don't date somebody that is not a Christian. That's what it means, okay? Now, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Just don't date somebody that's not a Christian. That's what it says. You say, well, Rick, why in the world? Because I know if I date them that I'll probably bring them to church and they'll probably get saved. Excuse me. They'll come to church with you for a little while, okay? And they may even make a profession of faith, but it's highly unlikely because God never designed the dating relationship to be an evangelism exercise, all right? He didn't. And so understand how important it is then that you make that commitment. People say, well, I'll never find somebody. Well, do you know how many people I talk to who wish they hadn't found that person? <laughs> Whole bunch of them. I mean, they wish they had never seen him the first time. So <laughs> understand, you're okay. You're absolutely okay. Totally okay. And all I'm trying to communicate is don't violate God's principles. If you do, you mess it up. I always tell a couple when I'm talking to them, that every good marriage has a threesome in the relationship. Not only a relationship between the couple that's getting married, but both of them, he has a relationship with Jesus, she has a relationship with Jesus. That relationship that he has with Jesus changes his values, it changes his attitude, it changes his ethics, her relationship with Jesus changes her attitudes, it changes her ethics. What does it do then? It makes it where they have compatible values, compatible ethics, and a compatible relationship, not only with each other, but with Jesus Christ. And let me tell you something, if Karen and I had not had that third person in our relationship, we would never have celebrated 42 years of marriage on August the 23rd. We would never would have. It takes that third person in the relationship. And so why would you date somebody that doesn't have that relationship with Jesus that you do? Because you've already, already set yourself up to be bamboozled, if I could just put it plainly, it's what you've done. 
And that's what's so unfortunate. And I just encourage us today to stop and understand that when it comes to this whole thing of commitment, it's so important to live by God's principles. You know, let me then turn us over to Daniel chapter 6. And um, very familiar passage of Scripture. Uh, I'm going to read it because I think that it'll help put it in context. But, you know, if you have been around church very much at all, you heard the story of Daniel and the lion's den, all right? Well, let me just pick up at Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any god or man except to you, O king, will be thrown into the lion's den? King answered, The decree stands in accordance with the laws of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the decree that you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed, and he was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. Then the men went as a group to the king and said to him, Remember, O king, that according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, no degree, decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and the rings of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment. He didn't even turn his TV on that night. That's what it boiled down to Being brought to him, and he could not sleep. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouth of the lions. They have not heard me because I, have never, because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I done anything wrong before you, O king. The king was overjoyed and gave the orders to lift Daniel out of the den. When Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den. Isn't that a little twist of events? These guys that wanted Daniel thrown into the lion's den, um, they were thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and their children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and men, men of every language throughout the land, May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Now, I don't think you find a better example of deep commitment to God than you see in Daniel's circumstances. And see, here's what I say. Deep commitment in my life and overcoming the fears of commitment starts with deep commitment to God. And that's what I want to challenge us if, to understand. If we're going to overcome this fear of commitment that we've been talking about, be able to demonstrate commitment in a powerful, life-changing way to influence the people that we are, you know, have influence over, then we've got to start with this deep, deep commitment to God that enables us to do what God wants us to do, no matter how difficult it may be. You know, it would have been very easy for Daniel to have just gone to a closet somewhere and prayed. But instead, he continued to do what he knew he was supposed to do. So let me give you a few, a few insights into this biblical example of deep God commitment. 
First of all, Daniel's God commitment is based upon complete confidence in God. Daniel 6.10. Now, when Daniel learned the decree had been published, he went up to, went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to God just as he had done before. Let me make it really clear. When we face situations that challenge our commitment, it really is to another person, to another situation, etc. When we face those situations, then we're either going to run from them, we're going to hide from them, or we're going to trust God to do what only God can do. And Daniel has amazing confidence that his God is able to deliver him from the lion's den. But if his God does not deliver him from the lion's den, he has just as much confidence that his God does not make mistakes. And that's what's so important for us to understand, that we can trust God completely with situations that are difficult to maintain commitment in. Daniel's commitment gave him courage in his time of crisis. Daniel 16, verses 16 through 22. It is there that Daniel's thrown into the lion's den. I'm not going to read those verses. I just read it. The stones placed over the mouth of the den. Daniel spends the night there. The king is miserable. He gets up the next morning and he goes down to see what is going on. Let me just put it this way. It takes courage to stand against the prevailing notions of our culture and our culture that we live in does not communicate that commitment is an important part of anyone's life today. In fact, our culture tells us that if you're not happy, then break your commitments. I am totally amazed at the number of people who make commitments and never live by them. They actually will sign statements that they will or will not do certain kinds of things and turn right around and do the exact opposite. All I can tell you is that it's essential for us to understand that God will give us the courage. You know, I talked about marriage being a four-wheeler kind of relationship. God will give us the courage to resist the pressures of our culture, to walk away from tough places in our lives. I want to challenge us today to understand that that can only come from God. And then Daniel's deep God commitment had tremendous impact on the people around him. And that's whenever the king issues this decree that goes throughout the whole kingdom and says, listen, you respect the God of Daniel. I just think it's important to keep in mind that our lives never have greater influence and ever have greater impact than whenever we simply live by our commitments, whatever they are. And I cannot tell all of us how important it is that no matter what our past may have been like, you may have walked away from a half a dozen or a dozen commitments of different kinds in your life. You may have walked away from more than that. And you may look at it and say, Rick, I don't have the strength to live by commitment. Well, let me tell you something. With God's help today, you can see that changed forever. And all I'm challenging us to do is not live with regret over past failures in our lives. It is to understand that God calls us to live with deep commitment, no matter what the fears uh, that, you know, that we deal with in relationship to that commitment may be. Because that's where faith and trust and confidence in God comes in. And when we begin to understand that God is wanting to specially work through our lives to make great impact, on others through our commitments it transforms the influence of our lives you know i shared with you a few moments ago that my mom and dad because of their deep deep commitment to god their deep commitment to each other and their deep commitment to raising us to live for jesus christ have batted a thousand all i'm trying to communicate is this they had no idea that that consistent commitment that they demonstrated would influence us at the level that it has. And I want to encourage us to understand how important it is today. Stop and recognize that God says, if you'll live 
by your commitments. Your life will have great impact. You say, well, Rick, what about people who didn't get delivered from the lion's den? What about someone like Stephen, the first martyr? Stephen was not delivered from those who were stoning him. But Stephen's death had such impact on a young Jewish rabbi by the name of Saul of Tarsus that some months later, he's on his way to Damascus and he has this encounter with Jesus Christ. And how does it go? Saul, Saul, it is hard to kick against the pricks. What is he saying? It is hard not to know that Christianity is true. You're trying to convince yourself it isn't, but you saw something in Stephen's death because he had said that his face was like that of an angel. And he looked up into heaven and saw amazing things. What happened? Because of Stephen's obedience, then the apostle Paul comes to faith in Jesus Christ, becomes the apostle to the Gentiles. Do you have any idea why you and I are Christians today and not in a world that is controlled by Islam or Hinduism or something such as that? We're Christians today because there was a guy who was stoned to death, not hating those stoning him, but focusing on his Savior, that God used his death to impact Saul Tarsus' life in such a way that he comes to faith in Jesus, becomes the apostle to the Gentiles, took the gospel message to Europe. That gospel message then went through all of Europe, jumped the Atlantic to North America, and influences my life and your life right now. Why? Because of a deep commitment to God. I want to challenge us today to understand you and I can have lives that make great impact and great influence and have great influence on others if we will allow God to help us to overcome our fear of commitment in our life. And the time to start that is right now. Our theme verse for this sermon series has been what? Psalm 34, 4. I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all of my fears from all of my fears i would encourage you to memorize that verse think about it every time you have a fearful thought go through your mind and realize that god will deliver us from all of our fears and that's what god wants to do today so i want to pray with you now that god will help all of us to be delivered from the fear of commitment in our lives god we come to you and realize that many of us in this room are just gripped with fears of commitment. We're scared to death that if we make a commitment that it's going to result in all kinds of things that are hurtful and damaging in our, in our lives. And so we just have found it easier to walk away than to plow through. But I pray, God, you would help us to have the kind of commitment that whether it calls us to a lion's den, whether it calls us to a place of being stoned like Stephen was, whatever it is that our commitment to you will be so deep that it then impacts our commitment in our marriages, it impacts our commitment to our God and to our church, it impacts our commitment, God, to live in ways that honor and glorify you. Praise you right now for what you're gonna do in each of our lives. And then God, I just pray for those who come here dealing with all kinds of fears in our lives because we simply have never experienced a life-changing personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I pray at this moment that those who do not know you would join me in this very, very vital prayer and say, Jesus, thank you for dying as my substitute on the cross. I ask you to forgive me for my sins. I ask you to come into my life and to make me a brand new person. And I accept you as my savior and I allow you to take control of my life, and I want to live every day with an awareness that I'm a new person in you. And God, for what you will do in each of our lives now, we give you thanks and great praise, and we ask these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.